So we have the Boston Athenaeum, this uh, great representative literary uh, Boston's literary past and present, and the Writers' Room, Boston's literary present and future. What do we do with this panel to underscore the nature of this collaboration? Uh, why not have three of the city's most important contemporary writers discuss the New England writers from the recent or distant past who contributed to their lives, inspired their work, inhabited their imaginations? Why not highlight the communal aspects of this solitary work of writing? For if literature is usually produced in solitude, it rarely emerges from a vacuum. Um, each of our panelists tonight will discuss a writer or writers who have been important to them, thereby hopefully revealing more than they realize about themselves, which is what we're really interested in. Um, and we'll ask them some questions and then um, buy their books. Um, given the stature of our writers this evening, we don't really need to do traditional introductions. Mention Tom Parada's four acclaimed novels, his brilliant short story collection, Bad Haircuts, um, his work in TV and film, or his uh, relationship with Reese Witherspoon. Um, <laughs> we don't need to mention Gail Mazur's four honest, tough, and lyrical collections of poetry, her forthcoming collection of selected poems, which is that rarest of tributes played, uh, paid to um, contemporary poets, her distinguished career as a teacher, the fact that her most recent collection was a finalist for the National Book Award, and we don't need to list the titles of all seven of Dennis Lehane's best-selling, multi-award-winning novels, uh, enumerate the many languages into which they've been translated, or utter the words Clint Eastwood or the Academy Awards. Um, instead, <clears throat> the Writers' Room has an ongoing fundraising program called Thank a Book, and donors to the room are encouraged to make a pledge in honor of uh, a book that has moved them or pleased them or made their lives a little better. So I will use this vehicle to read you some of the thank -a books that have been uh, sent to the room in honor of these writers. Uh, someone named Trish Rogers wrote the following about Tom's novel, Little Children. I want to thank Tom Parada's Little Children because it gave me a laugh and made me think about my own life a little differently. He captures the joys and miseries, the irresistible annoyances of married life perfectly, and the crushed Cheerios aggravation of parenthood better than anyone I've read in a long time. Um, someone named a fisherman wrote, uh, uh, a period fishman, sorry, um, <laughs> wrote this tribute to Gail Mazur. I'm thanking Mazur's they can't take that away from me because when I found myself struggling through a rough patch of my life and nothing was working for me, not hope, despair, or Rilke's being in the question, someone gave me Mazur's harshly lit five poems entitled Questions, and they did work. And Anne Collette said the following about Dennis Lehane. I'm making this donation as a tribute to Dennis Lehane's first four novels. I took them with me on a trip to Thailand, and Lehane's skills as a storyteller and prose stylist not only made me forget the discomforts of a 32-hour journey, they also reacquainted me with the true meaning of the word awe, awe, A-W-E. Um, <laughs> And now let's all thank our writers this evening, and uh, we'll turn the discussion over to them. I don't know if you have in mind any, um, if any of you would like to begin. I, I know we haven't really um, rehearsed this discussion, so uh, is anyone dying to start off the uh, conversation? Tom? <laughs> so, oh, we can go alphabetically, too. That's easy for the person in the middle to say. Dennis Lohan. Tom Perot. Tom Perot. Right. I don't want to cause, a, cause any trouble here. Um, you know, what I meant to do before coming here, and, and I've been meaning to for some time, was reread uh, the four books that I, I came here to speak about, and what happened uh, was that there was uh, some there were a few baseball games uh, <laughs> in October that cut into my reading time, uh, and then an election, um, which kept me up at night but not didn't allow me to read much, um, and then I, I just needed to read Willa Cather's My Antonia, and I was going to get to these four books, and that took me a lot longer than than I expected. 
So I'm going to have to talk a little bit more off the top of my head than I wanted to about uh, John Updike's rabbit books. Um, but that's okay because they've meant a lot to me over a long period of time and, and I have a, a fair uh, number of things to say about them. But one thing I, I will say is, you know, I'm not a New England writer by birth. Um, you know, there's a writer like Dennis who grew up here, writes about the world where he grew up with, grew up with the world he grew up in. Um, and there's a kind of continuity in that and a kind of uh, embeddedness, I think, that, that lends it. You know, real richness to to his work. I, I grew up in New Jersey, and I often write about New Jersey. Though I, I have started to branch out a little bit geographically, um, and and one of the reasons I think that Updike is a good uh, person for me to talk about here is that his great rabbit books um, are not set in uh, Massachusetts, even though he's a, he's now a kind of New England writer, and he owns this a certain part of this world in a way that, that Dennis owns another part of this world. Um, his rabbit books, which are set in the world that he grew up in and the, and the world that he left, um, I think are, are his most uh, substantial and, and remarkable works. And I, I would have to say, you know, uh, people can, can argue about who our most important writers are. And, um, you know, some people will put Bellow on, on the top of that list and some people will put Roth on top of that list. And, and I can understand, I particularly understand putting Roth on top of the list. Um, and I think that there's some work by Updike that leaves me completely cold. But uh, th those rabbit books, I think, are, to me, the, the best testament to the many things that, that novels can do, and novels as social documents. I think, you know, if the four rabbit books were, you know, sealed up tight and people who could read English found them a thousand years from now, they'd, they'd know a whole lot about the way that we lived in the past uh, 50 years. I can't think of another four books that, that would do it uh, so well. Um, uh, you know, the first book, Rabbit Run, to me is the uh, essential document of the early sexual revolution. Um, and, and I guess, all, you know, all four books are really about the sexual revolution and you know, people finding themselves maybe a couple steps behind it and running to catch up and making fools of themselves while doing it, um, but huffing and puffing all the way. Um, the second one, I think, is the most amazing one, and the one maybe the most flawed and, and least read right now, Rabbit Redux, uh, which is set in, in the 60s, and Updike tried to create a kind of um, microcosm of the 1960s in one suburban house. So uh, there's a runaway girl who Rabbit sort of picks up and brings into the house. His wife has left, he's raising his son, and she brings a sort of street hustler slash uh, black revolutionary into the house. And basically in their sort of stoned and drunk discussions, they kind of recreate this national dialogue. And, and you know, there's, there's a lot of risks a writer takes when he does something like that. Um, <coughs> And there are scenes that seem ridiculous. But I swear, if you, if you go back and read that now, there's so much of the energy of the 60s packed into that book and so much about the energy of the 60s being stuck right in Rabbit's face. You know, his, his kid kind of uh, going over to the other side, himself being both drawn and repelled by the energy of, of the hippie girl and, and the black revolutionary and, you know, all kinds of ideological and, and racial uh, tensions, you know, sort of breaking out in this petty little ways with, within this house. Um, th that's a book I, I really, uh, you know, heartily recommend to, to reread. Um, the next one, Rabbit is Rich, um, is, is about set in the ga gas crisis years of the 70s, and um, Rabbit, has be who's been a failure uh, through much of his adult life, and somebody who looked back on his uh, high school basketball glory days as the, the high point of his life, has made one smart decision. Um, he's now started to sell Toyotas for his father-in-law. And the gas crisis has made, uh, you know, uh, econ amazingly, you remember those days? <laughs> High gas prices made people buy small cars. Um, I, I don't understand what they were thinking. Um, and Rabbit, Rabbit gets rich, and he's sort of uh, caught up in the, the wife-swapping uh, 70s. And there, there's some, uh, you know, beautiful comedy uh, and also incredibly raunchy uh, sexual writing around that. And then uh, the, the 
the series ends uh, with Rabbit at Rest, where this man of enormous appetites um, is just gorging himself to death on, on junk food. And, and uh, you know, the, there's a the famous scene that kind of ends the, the series where he's dressed as Uncle Sam and, you know, marching in this, this, uh, this parade. And, and it, you know, I, I think it's one of those moments that if you don't earn it, it seems seems cheap, and if you do, just just seems you know transcendental. I mean, the, this guy really is a, an emblem of of America, you know, in all of its appetites and all of its uh, history. And um, you know, he's both ridiculous and kind of true to himself. And and uh, you know, ne- never noble's not the right word, but but he he is uh, you know this authentic American and and. Um, you know, I think Updike was was very brave about identifying Americanness as as sort of this this flawed appetite, you know, but but also somehow, you know, this appealing hunger. Uh, you can look at it in in two different ways. Um, but I, I just stand by saying that Updike matters to me. He was uh, he grew up in a very small town, and and I remember him saying in in his memoir, Self Consciousness, that what he really wrote for was that some kid like him would find his books in a in a dusty small town library and and have the kind of uh life changing experience that that he had as a kid in his own library and I remember reading that and feeling like yeah i I sort of was that kid you know I found rabbit run in high school and and was one of those books that made me think, "Wow, you know th- there's there's some real power in in this form, and I, and I would like to, um, you know, learn how to try do that myself, or at least give it a try. So I'll, I'll uh, just tip my hat to Updike. Tom, do you, could you say a little bit more about the idea of novel as a social document? Um, I mean, is that something you're conscious of when you're writing your own books? Uh, no, and I think it'd be bad to be <laughs> too conscious of it. I think more if you do it right. Uh-huh. It's just full of information. I took a French history class in college, and uh, the teacher had us read Zola and Balzac, and and it it was you know it was really true. That I think I, we learned a lot more about French history and how French people lived in those days from reading those novels than you would from I, I think unless you went really deeply into historical research. Um, in fact, I, I was at this reading the other night, and Andre Debus the Third um, read. He basically interviewed a soldier in Iraq, um, but then wrote it. It was just a beautifully written piece that used her words, but but just evoked you know what it was like to be there, but better than you know a hundred newspaper articles. There's just some way in which you know a specific story in a specific place and time tells you more about how people plural live than um, you know lots of demographic information or, or uh, generalizations. Um, when Steve called me, he he said, "I know, I know, you've written about Louisa May Alcott," and I thought, "Oh, I've been, am I going to be saddled with that?" And and uh, the truth is that I loved Louisa May Alcott as a child, and that she she shaped my life really, but that I like to think of myself as formed as a writer by other other writers that I love, and I sort of was struggling between these two great Yankee writers as a, a, that, that influenced me. Louisa May Alcott sort of shaped my life, and can I be heard? Okay. And um, um, at 18, I first heard Robert Lowell and really was thunderstruck by by his work and his presentation of his work, and that that influence and that love of his work has has stayed with me ever since. But I want to talk about Louisa May Alcott in a way in connection with something with the last thing that you said about Updike writing for the for the child in a small town who doesn't who isn't living in a literary culture who isn't who isn't born to become part of a a, a, a writer's life. I don't think Alcott was writing for that, but 
to a, a young girl who was a, the, the child of, grandchild of Jewish immigrants who had settled in Boston, whose parents were born in Boston. What I really read there was this was a story, and it was her story really, of an ungainly child who wanted to be alone in a room writing, who wanted to take care of her family and not be saddled with her family, who had all the kind of uh, unruly feelings that a writer has of wanting to be alone and want, wanting to be loved, um, who felt like a misfit, which also, of course, Lowell was, who, who, uh, who grew up on Beacon Hill and didn't, didn't belong. They, the Lowells weren't the right branch of the Lowells. And uh, he, he went to Harvard. He, he went to Harvard, and he did the unthinkable, which was to drop out and transfer to Kenyon. I mean, it was uh, I, probably no one in the family had ever heard of Kenyon. I mean, he was um, bipolar, and just uh, you know, poor Bobby was was a disgrace to the whole family. Um, and uh, and had a very actually a very a uh, tortured relationship to the family because he didn't actually walk away from that whole family. He stayed in a tortured relationship to it. Um, what I had in common with Louisa May Alcott was that I was tall. I think that was about it. But I read Little Women probably from the time I was eight years old, just about every three months for the rest of my childhood and adolescence. I read it... Um, at the beginning of a lifelong um, bout with insomnia. Um, I, there, was somebody, there was somebody who was writing about what it was like to be um, funny instead of feminine, to be wanting what your sisters had and not getting it because you were unruly or didn't you know, didn't keep your mouth shut when you were supposed to. Um, and I watched this character pursue her dream and write lurid, uh, lurid stories to try to make a living, which in fact Louisa May Alcott did. But she was an extraordinary woman. I mean, she, she came from this abolitionist family. She worked as a nurse in the Civil War and destroyed her health doing that and she did support this whole really feckless family her philosopher father who was the most hapless member of the transcendentalists who was who was um, supported and tolerated by Emerson and and, uh, and his circle but who was really impossible and little women was really Joe was actually the first feminist heroine in and, uh, in American literature, but I didn't know from that when I was a child reading this. All I knew was that she wanted to drown her sister when her sister read her diary. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so did I. Um, <laughs> and my sister didn't even read my diary. I just would rather drown her than share a bedroom with her. But um, that, that really did shape me. And what I found out when I was older, when someone asked me to write about the collected letters, was that some other most unlikely women had also fantasized that they were Joe. And I realized that she, she was a symbol for women, American girls, for probably a century. And the more I read about it, I didn't realize that it was a crossover novel in the 19th century that adults read it. And I remember once talking to Justin Kaplan about it, and he, his mother died when he was 11. And his father, who was probably an immigrant himself, read him Little Women at night. And I said, well, how would you like Louisa May Alcott? She thought Mark Twain was disgusting. And he said, nobody's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> But um, there's, a leap, there's a great leap from Louisa May Alcott, whom I grew up to think of as moralistic and sentimental. But in fact, if you, if you really look at that book, she was tough as nails. What Joe wanted, Joe pursued.
with a with a hardness that uh, that a writer has to have, and you know it's not that writers don't love their families. Uh, when I when I was in high school, as I said, I heard Robert Lowell for the first time, and uh, and his work um, in its sense of history in its openness. I mean, he had just begun to write the poems that became life studies that were both autobiographical and absolutely frank, but also um, brilliant in their, in their real detail and completely aware of the world around them, which, which was a standard for me of uh, how to survive in the world, for one thing, and it was how I, how I wanted to survive as a writer. To be um, to be unsparing in, in how I observed what was going on, and and uh, I think um, you know there's a way you can talk about the social novel. I mean, Lowell came to write also a public poem that was never rhetorical. That uh, that is so hard to do in America, uh, you know that. Uh, that we have so much freedom that it's very that it's very hard to write a political poem, but he came to write a kind of poem which was able to take in the culture and what was what was at work in our in our political life that uh, it was it set an incredible standard and was very very touching. I mean, his his great poem for the Union Dead, which which was written on the occasion. Well, it was it was written wasn't written on the occasion. It was written about the Robert Gould Shaw monument and the um, Robert Gould Shaw was uh, the the monument at the opposite the state house here. Um, that was the uh, Negro infantry that, in the Civil War that was sent in to die at Fort Wagner. Um, but. Uh, it was around the time of the the school desegregation in the South, so he had brought in the bomb, school desegregation, abolition, um, the destruction of of the natural world. It was an incredible poem, and it wasn't at all rhetorical. And it, it's a heartbreaker. It's a standard that uh, that one would love to meet and just sort of circle around, but if. It, you know, I love teaching it. I love reading it, um, and and uh, and I'm always marvel that uh, that these two that these two Yankee poles are my uh, are my guides. They have uh, in common. You talked about unruly emotions, and I mean Lowell certainly had an unruly. Psyche. I mean, being bipolar and you know very troubled person. Um, but it's interesting, you know, to use that and take a formal structure of poetry. And um, do you think that impulse to kind of um, order that unruly psyche is at work? Um, is sort of driving the need to create in Lowell or in moi? Les deux. <laughs> <laughs> Both. <coughs> uh, well, um, let's talk about Lowell. Okay. <laughs> um, actually, what happened with Lowell was that he started out before the really severe manic breaks. He was a very formal, clotted poet, and uh, the the poetry w became more open and free verse. But it, but he always had a formal thing. I I don't really uh, the the being a poet at all probably kept him alive until he mm. was sixty. So it's so hard to say with with that kind of illness. Um, you know where people on the outside often say that sort of being an artist drove a person to his death or something. But in fact, you know I think that it did it did save him. Um, but it is a way of making order, of, of making order, and I, I do think that an expressive life can be a can be a, a lifesaver. But um, but it isn't like therapy. Hmm. 
I mean, he was so brilliant. And he also had such a passion for history that everything started, everything piled in. As the years went on, all this history kept piling into the poems more and more intensely, so it almost couldn't be contained. Mm -hmm. It was hard to find the container for all that history. I don't think that answered your question, but it's one, I, it one I'd answer. really like to avoid. <laughs> yeah, right. We'll ask later about you. Know, Dennis? Um, hi. Well, I, I got to tell two tiny little anecdotes. This is really bizarre. I've, I've, some sort of lattice of coincidence going on. I was leaving my apartment to come here, and the last thing I wrote was something about the, just a vague little reference to the, uh, the 54th. Uh, hmm. Regiment, Masters 54. And, uh, and then, I swear to God, I'm not going for a cheap joke here. I was, just because this is the way a writer's mind works a lot, you're just thinking of words, and I was walking to put on my coat. I went and I started to put on my coat, and I thought, I wonder if I'll ever get to use the word bifurcation. <laughs> and you used it. I was wondering that, too, and I, so I really... <laughs> Shape the whole introduction. I just thought, how can I get that. that in? You know, can I ever use bifurcation? You know, it's like saying detritus. Can I ever really slip it in? You know. Um, you just did. So there you go. So I was very. I was, I was, wow, something weird's going on. Um, I, I'm going to say something that's heresy, given uh, October to start. One is that the most influential um, novelists on me tended to be New York novelists. Sorry. Um, Richard Price and William Kennedy were probably. Um, mm -hmm. along with Fitzgerald, who's everybody's daddy. Um, <laughs> who's your daddy? F. Scott. Um, so, uh, the, the, I mean, Richard Price was without a doubt, hands down, the biggest influence on me. Um, and uh, it was funny, the, East, the Eastwood thing uh, reference earlier, when, the, when Eastwood was in town and, and uh, I was spending a lot of time with, with him and, and um, Sean Penn, particularly to the point where they had to separate us and um, and the movie stars and everything, and, and everybody kept saying, well, aren't, aren't you enjoying yourself? And I said, no, not really. it doesn't mean anything to me. There was no context to it. It was just sort of, okay, they're actors. And I'd say to people, do you know actors? And everybody knows actors. Every, you all know them. Um, they're just, you know, waiters somewhere. And <laughs> do, you, do you feel particularly special when you're around them? Per, you know, probably not so much. Um, and that was kind of how I felt. But then... Uh, and nobody believed me. Everybody thought I was being falsely modest. And then Richard Price came to town and called me up out of the blue and asked me to go to dinner with him. And I, and I spent the entire time at dinner just, just go, you know, going, remember, you're a peer. He thinks you're a peer. You've sold it. You've sold it. Just be cool. Don't say anything stupid. Just be cool. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Richard Price's The Wanderers was, was the most influential book on me. And, uh, and then the book that influenced him, probably in the Great Continuum, Last Exit to Brooklyn by Hubert Selby, was also a major influence. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, what happened in terms of New England authors, I would say, uh, one who I, I just I, I don't think uh, is given nearly enough credit because of his commercial success is, is Robert Parker. Um, in terms of what he did to the genre in which I began working, which was the Private Eye novel, he completely revolutionized it. If you go, there is, there is literally a... Um, a split, a bifurcation, if you will, in, <laughs> in sort of American noir letters of, of sort of pre-Parker and post-Parker. And, and if you go back before him, it's like stepping back into the Dark Age. Um, you know, it was the first book that, the first books that consistently used humor. It was the first book in which the hero was, was literate. It was the, f you know, such as we understand it. It was um, the, the first book that had any sense of a modern age in it um, when you look at, you know, the, the beginning books that began in the early 70s. So, um, the, and, and I think also just the humor, the Boston humor um, was, was for me the thing that made me, I remember when you used to have to hunt Parker down uh, before he became a, a smash success, when I used to have to go to Victor Hugo and, and, and find his, his little crappy looking paperbacks. I mean, they're just terrible. And... Um, and so that was that was a big thing because I've always I've always loved um, and been fascinated by the balance of humor in um, in fiction. How do you put humor in in a very dark, um, sometimes dark narrative? Um, and uh, so uh, I would say you know Parker was a big influence on me. But then to swing away from that, when I went to college, um, 
and this is something Tom and I have discussed several times, we sort of stepped in in, in the sort of the, the late, the, the post-70s um, uh, vacuum in which um, uh, the, the world of, of literature, American literature, had certainly changed in the writing, in the writing world. And there was a big push for sort of um, postmodernism and post-structuralism and a big move away from traditional storytelling. And what I discovered over a long period of time, uh, I was a short story writer, by the way. I never expected to be a novelist. That was the most bizarre accident of my life, and thank God for it. Um, but, uh, and I'll tell you why this is, I will swing back to this point. I was very, a de very dedicated short story writer. I thought I was going to be a short story writer. People to this day who were in school with me or taught me are still surprised I became a novelist. Um, and uh, uh, so I read everybody, and again, there was this movement afoot that I didn't realize until later. Um, you would have a carver who was a genius, and then you would have a bunch of little baby carvers. carvers. Or you would have um, a Fowles or a Barth, who are arguably geniuses, and then you have a bunch of little baby Fowles, and baby Barths. <laughs> and then you would have a Don DeLillo, who I think is unequivocally a genius, and then you would have a bunch of baby Don DeLillos. And uh, my feeling became gradually, as the movement spread into this sort of non-traditional, non-linear, post-modern, post-structuralist um, type of literature, uh, you know what? Most of these people suck. <laughs> Not the, the, the real ones, but the pretenders. All the pretenders. And the pretenders are becoming what is being taught in the schools. And we are being forced to write like this when it's not in our heart. Don DeLillo can't write any other way. He's not pretending anything. It's like saying, um, it's like the people who do um, magic realism when they, when they grew up in Iowa or they went to school at Iowa. Um, <laughs> Gabriel Garcia Marquez couldn't have written any other way. He didn't know he was creating a new form. He was just doing. And so um, I began to gradually hear this little voice in my head that was saying, you, you know, and I tried to push it away, that was saying, you're a traditionalist, you're a traditionalist, you're a traditionalist, you're a traditionalist. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm avant-garde. I'm dangerous. <laughs> um, I'm experimental. And, and then uh, I discovered at that time, um, I discovered Andre de Buse, um, the elder, who was uh, a very traditional short story writer, um, although he did amazing things. Um, he took amazing risks within the, within the traditional structure of his stories. If you read a, a story, for example, like The Fat Girl, he breaks just about every single rule that exists in terms of narrative form and Aristotelian logic. He just shatters them. But he does it so quietly. And there's no look-at-me writing type of writing, which to me becomes very tiring. Um, so I discovered Debuse, uh right when I was wrapping up college, actually, I came to him late, like a lot of people, because he wasn't considered fashionable to read. Um, he wasn't a minimalist when everybody was doing minimalism. He wasn't, um, uh, he wasn't doing anything that was sort of uh, show-off-y in a, in, a, in a linguistic way. So he was very much out of fashion for most of his writing career. Um, and uh, when I discovered him, was when I began to decide that I could not be a short story writer. And I'll tell you why. I was reading Debuse at the exact same time I was reading Alice Munro, and I went on a checkoff kick. And what I discovered reading those writers was that they could put whole novels into 30 pages. Alice Munro was astonishing at it. Um, and uh, I, I said, you know, I've never entered a race to become second. I just won't do it. And I will never write this well in this form. I will never be as good as Debuse. I will never be as good as Chekhov, and I will never be good as Monroe. So the hell with it. I'm going to go try a novel. It seems easier. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened was, actually, the novel is much easier and much more built for me. I, was, I thought I was, for years, I thought I was a, no a short story writer who somehow fluked into novels. But the truth is, is I was always a novelist who thought he was a short story writer. Um, that I need the more expansive breadth of the form. I'm not good... Um, being uh, sort of working within what I think is the single most challenging form out there, in my personal opinion, I think the short story. I, I still love the short story probably more than in any form. Um, but I just, I just didn't have it at the level that Debuse did. 
And what I loved about Tobias too was that he um, he was absolutely uh, the opposite of a minimalist. And minimalism is is a wonderful form. And and Carver again is a genius, one of my favorite writers. But um, but too many of the of the Carverites and the and the the Carver lights and the baby rays. Um, it, as a friend of mine said uh, once, we were talking about the New Yorker. We both subscribe to the New Yorker, and, and we said that we would, uh, if we read one more story set in a suburban kitchen with two yuppies suffering from malaise, we were going to cancel our subscription. <laughs> um, and and so what I loved about Tobias was Tobias would write stories in which, which really grand things happened on a very small scale: the death of your son. And, and the decision to kill the person who killed your son, which is killings which came in the bedroom, um, which I thought, I remember reading that story and just going, 20, 20 pages? He did this in 20 pages and saying, you, you know, <laughs> just, just, you got to be, I will never do this in my life. Um, and, uh, and then he would take on, he would wrestle with um, very large issues as, as big as, is there a God? Uh, what is my relationship with God, um, which which I just found fascinating, and not in he's often dismissed the way Percy is dismissed as a Catholic novelist, and I think that's just so reductive and pejorative. Um, these are both writers who who investigate the relationship with God. They're not um, restricted by any sort of dogma of the religion in which they they came from, which was Catholicism. Um, that's like calling Green a Catholic novelist, which if you read Green, you, you realize it's the most idiotic thing that could ever be said. Um, Green was a really terrible Catholic, and, <laughs> and he enjoyed the hell out of writing about how bad a Catholic he was. And um, so uh, and I would say the story that had the most um, shattering effect on me as a writer was, um, and it's one of his more famous stories by Debus, so I'm not doing anything novel here, but is uh, a father's story which is a story in which a very religious man um, uh, has his daughter come home to him and say that she believes she, she hit somebody in a driving home in her car. And he goes and he finds the man off the road and he watches him die. Um, it's an absolutely chilling story. And the end of the story is a conversation he has with God in which he, he covers up for the daughter's crime. He covers up and he sends her away and he, and he, and he has this conversation with God. Now, if you have a conversation with God in a book, there's only two ways it can go. It's either got to hit all the way and be the most masterful thing ever written, or it's a disaster. It's going to be an embarrassment. So, you know, it's, it's pretty much I'm, when I'm teaching, I say, stay away from God. Just stay away from God. You know, it, young men, stay away from sex. Don't write the stripper story. Just stay away from sex. But... Um, but when it comes to just God, just leave God out of it until you're a little older. Um, Tavius has a, a, a father story ends with a, a one-page conversation between this very religious man who has now broken every tenet of his religion and, and his God um, as he's walking to, uh, I believe, to feed his horses. And uh, the, the, the line that, that God says to him, uh, you should have you turned her in. And, and he says, uh, I, I can't, and uh, you, you can't ask that of me. And God says, pretty much, look who you're talking to. Uh, and, and, he said, and God says, I sacrificed my own son. And the father says, it's different. It was a son. This is my daughter. And God says, so you love her more than me. And the father says, I love her more than truth which was one of the single most chilling lines I've ever read. Um, and to me, the, the absolute definition of, of love, of, of obsessive love, of true love, of the love you feel for a child, of the love you feel for a parent, um, that, that you love it more than, than truth. And so um, that was the moment when I said, I can't do this. I'm going to become a novelist. <laughs> and maybe with 350 pages behind me, I can earn a line like that. But I can't do it in 20. Um, and so that's, 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 I would say, the single most influential New England writer on, on my work. Andre. Andre, yes. 
You know, Dennis, it's so funny because as I was putting on my coat this evening to come down here, I was thinking, am I ever going to have an opportunity to use the word Aristotelian? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if you pronounce that correctly once, you save it for the rest of your really? life. <laughs> um, could you just, I, I know you talked very eloquently about uh, Andrew DeBoos, uh, but I, I really share your enthusiasm for Richard Price. And mm -hmm. um, I wonder, I, and to me he seems, uh, I mean, he's certainly well known and, and uh, sells very well and all, but I think in, in certain respects he's incredibly underrated oh, yeah. uh, as, as, an, as a, you know, a, an artist. And I was wondering if you could say what appeals to you particularly um, about his work. Price, uh, Price wrote his first novel when he was 24. Um, you, you want to talk about something that makes a writer go, you. Uh, that's it. Um, he uh, it was called The Wanderers. It was about a gang in the South Bronx in the 60s. Uh, it was a collection of short It was originally written as a collection of short stories. And the editor said, we can't do anything with short stories, but this really could be easily turned into a novel. And so Price went back and spent a year on it. He turned it into a novel, and he published it. I read that book when I was um, 14. And it was the first book that... Um, the people spoke and acted the way people I knew spoke and acted. Even though they're from the 1960s Bronx, and this would have been 1979 Boston, um, I could completely identify with, with everybody. And that was when I knew that I could write the kind of stories I wanted to write. And that was when I knew that, that, that it was okay not to write about Jake Atts or Kings or uh, saints or, or whatever else I'd been exposed to in literature at that point. This was the groundbreaking moment. Price himself said the exact same moment happened to him with Last Exit to Brooklyn. Up until that point, he'd never found a book that was really speaking the language of, of the people he knew. Um, the, the thing about um, The Wanderers that still, t I, it's the book that I'll, I'll read usually once a year. Um, and I think he's written a be better novel since. I think Clockers is probably a better novel. But, but The Wanderers has that heat that you only get the first time out. I mean, I think my worst book is my first book, but I still go back and I look at it sometimes and just go, wow, I'd never have the guts to do that today. You know, like that's, there's, that, there's that purity to it. And so um, uh, in The Wanderers, what it had was it just had this incredible comedy. Um, it was a really funny, there's a hysterical, an absolutely hysterical gang fight in that book in which um, a bunch of football players are attacked by this, Irish, this group of Irish midgets and there's like a hundred, I swear to God, there, there's like, there's like a hundred and fifty of them. And they're, and they're called the Ducky Boys. And none of them, and none of them are above like five, four. And so at one point they attack, they, they keep showing up out of the forest as these guys are playing football in the Bronx. And they gradually realize that all the Ducky Boys, none of whom speak, they're really just this deranged creation. They're going to attack them. And they come in just attacking them with tire, um, tire irons and car aerials and, knives and and there's this one guy who's the evil father of one of the wanderers and he's 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 a truly um brilliant creation and he he picks up two ducky boys by the legs and he starts <laughs> using them to beat other ducky boys <laughs> and, and in the in the height of all this his son looks up and the father is the last one standing the ducky boys beat the hell out of everybody Except for the father. They, they all realize this guy's truly crazy. And he's standing there covered in blood, swinging two bloody ducky boys, <laughs> screaming at the sky. And his son, who he beats mercilessly and beats his wife mercilessly, he's just an evil, evil man. Um, his son sees him standing there like this great warrior at the end of the battle. And he runs towards him um, with this sudden outpouring of love and, and connection. And his father turns around at the last second and punches him in the stomach so hard that he vomits all over the field. And that's how it ends. That chapter ends. And it's so sad and so poignant. And yet in the middle of all this insane hilarity. Um, I, I just, I, I can't say enough about that book. And it's, I really try physically to keep it in print. Because um, it's gone out of print like 19 times. And I'm always just like, The Wanderers, The Wanderers, the most important book I ever read. You know, keep, there you go. Every interview I give. Um, and, uh, and then what happened with Price, it was very interesting, and we had a conversation about this that I thought was really telling. He went, he went off to, he became an extremely successful screenwriter. Um, he wrote uh, five books, and then he just sort of stopped. And he just vanished from the stage, except as a, as a screenwriter. He wrote Color of Money. He wrote, um, uh, he wrote Ransom with Mel Gibson. Um, he's written some, uh, he wrote, uh, some brilliant films. And the, the ones that they always mess up are the ones of his own novels. Um, and then uh, he came back with Clockers after, after a more than 10-year disappearance. I think it was 12 years. 
Um, he came back with Clockers, which was, to me, uh, I couldn't, I remember reading Clockers when it came out in 92, 92, and saying, why isn't anybody else writing these novels? Why isn't anybody else, everything else that's going on in America right now, nothing seems more important than the crack epidemic. And what is everybody writing about? They're writing about professors on Ivy League, you know, universities having affairs with students. I've never heard that before. Um, here was a guy who went in and wrote a 600-page Dostoevskyan epic about the crack trade. And I just thought, just I'd give him, I would give him the National Book Award just for the guts. Um, and, uh, and then he followed that with Freedom Land, and then his last book was Samaritan. Um, but he is not, ultimately, he's not really well known outside of certain circles, I think, because he doesn't... Um, he doesn't do the book a year. He's very hard to define. And as he said to me, in, in the gap, the 12-year gap, what happened was he realized he ran, he ran out of autobiography. And so he returned um, in the same way I ended up falling into noir as, as he needed a skeleton because he didn't plot, <coughs> he didn't plot well naturally. And, uh, and so um, Clockers has the, the skeleton of a crime novel, although if you read it, you just go, if this is a crime novel, then... then Moby Dick's a fishing novel. I mean, um, and uh, and that was exactly how I came to noir too. I couldn't plot. I couldn't plot my way out of a paper bag. And and but a mystery gives you a very basic thing. Something bad happens, and by the end, it has to be dealt with. And so I was like, oh, that's a plot. I can work with that. Um, I have some questions, but I'm sure you all do as well. Um, would anyone like to begin the question and answer period? And if, yes. Oh, no, never. I will never, ever um, talk bad about a writer unless they've publicly talked bad about somebody else. So uh, my favorite quote on that is, is Anne Rice. I've said this a lot. Anne Rice once gave a very famous uh, interview in which she said, um, who are these people who read Updike and Tyler? I don't read Updike and Tyler. None of my friends do. And I thought that's because you're a moron, Anne, and you hang out with morons. <laughs> Beyond that, but you'd never say it publicly. I would say that publicly because <laughs> oh, yeah, she dissed did. somebody. Okay, yeah. It's it's just it's sort of like my issue with with I I make fun of um, I'm actually on a website as the devil for this uh, singer Morrissey because I've made fun of Morrissey in two different books, and it's because Morrissey dissed the Stones publicly, <laughs> and I just you know I'm sorry all ha ha hands off otherwise leave artists alone. I think it's a small group and we should be allowed to you know. Uh, It's called For the Union Dead. And it's, it, well, he's got the big collected now, but it was, from, it was the title poem of a volume called For the Union Dead. It was first read at the old Boston Arts Festival in 1960 in public. Yes. The, uh, the question there was uh, whether I've been influenced by uh, other Italian-American writers. Um, well, you know, the, the, the second writer who I might have talked about is, is somebody I think of more of as a contemporary, uh, Richard Russo. Um, and one of the reasons, I mean, I feel like I have a, a lot in common with, with Russo, and, and partly in a matter of um, small town, blue collar subject matter at times, um, but also ju just uh, the mix of, of humor and, and um, serious subject matter that, that uh, we both use. I, I came to him late. Um, I, well, actually, I mean, he, he's not much older than me, I think. Is, 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 so he's not, he's not someone I think of as a great influence, but more uh, as a writer that, um, you know, I'm following... I think pretty closely in his footsteps in that sense. But he, he's a writer who I, I feel a real kinship with, who's an Italian-American writer. I didn't grow up reading a lot of Italian-American writers or consciously reading them. I mean, I respect someone like Don DeLillo a lot, but don't think of him 
as an influence. Um, Ralph Lambrelia is a, a great uh, short story writer from uh, from the area, who, who I also feel a kinship with in terms of uh, he's Ralph's a very funny writer. Um, but you know, I, I I've often thought about this. Uh, I, I read way more, say, in terms of ethnic. Writing, I read way more Jewish writers, Jewish American writers, growing up, and felt you know kinship with Roth, who uh, came from the part of New Jersey that I came from, uh, and and Malamud, who I uh, who I really respect. I I think uh, only now am I becoming aware of a kind of Italian American literary voice and tradition. It wasn't something I grew up being aware of, um, and in fact, I'm much more aware of the presence of other Italian Americans in film and music, for example. Do you have any you'd like to recommend? <laughs> yes, I was wondering if you had any in mind. I, 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 what about Mario Puzo? <laughs> 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 I mean, you did read him, right? <laughs> Can I ask these fiction writers a question? Yes. Because I know, as a, as a poet, I not only hear in my head a lot of the time uh, poems, but I also hear certain fiction writers' sentences over and over in my head that I've been reading, particularly um, Roth and Isaac Bashevis singers. The rhythm of their sentences sometimes after I'm reading them just stays with me. Do you have that experience of the, just the sound of people that you're reading sort of ringing in your ears, or is that, is that not a, a thing? Oh, yeah. Hear? Oh, yeah, totally. I'm, I'm, um, I will, I will say, and I, I think it's, it's still the, the flaw that I work on the most, and it's still a very big flaw, is when I was in graduate school, one of my teachers said, you'd, you'd throw out everything, logic, character, everything, for a pretty sentence. That you would. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think it's true, because I, I, that's how I first came to it, was sort of the music of language, I think, was the first thing that attracted me to write it. And so I'm, I'm constantly thinking of the, the music of words, and I have... I have Sentences in my head from all the novels that I love, um, and they're all, and they're very musical sentences. Yeah. I mean, so we beat on both Vince Karn is a very <laughs> musical <laughs> sentence, yeah, you know. Right. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know that I do in the way that that you're talking about. You don't lie awake after you've been reading with the sort of the sort of sometimes like almost nonsense of the sound of the sentences. That you no, you know, I. I I'm actually troubled by this. I, I feel like my hard drive gets wiped clean <laughs> every time I read a book. It's just, I, I, you know, when I read, it's a very intense experience. But lately, because I stopped teaching, I think, which made me reflect on what I was reading. Uh, lately, I shut a book, and if, if there's if my wife hasn't read it, or if I'm not lucky enough to have a conversation with somebody else who, right then and there, it almost as if I haven't read the book, and I don't mind that so much. <laughs> I mean, it, it's different from before, where I retained all this. I feel like I've. I've hit some kind of saturation point where the, the disc just won't accommodate <laughs> any more information. But they told us it was endless. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yes. The question there is, uh, I think, a really interesting one. I'd actually like to hear Dennis's response as well, uh, because uh, you know, Dennis has written series books, and, and the people want these characters to return. And, and I think writers have very particular reasons. I mean, I think Updike really felt like he took him to the logical end, um, and you know, he must feel, in some sense, like like that's a, that's complete. And he also has an, another series about Beck, the the writer. Um, but I, I do feel that it was Updike's best vehicle for reflecting on the messiness of contemporary history. I, I, don't, I feel that w without it, um, some part of him as a writer has trouble emerging. Um, I haven't read the new book, which I, I maybe harkens back to some, some of that stuff. But um, it, it's tough for a writer. I mean, obviously, you don't want to keep repeating yourself, and you don't want to 
do something that's artificial or make a, a prequel or something like that. Um, he did follow that story to the... I mean, he doesn't actually die. On the, well, he does in the, the novella afterwards. Um, but uh, at Rabbit at Rest, you know, some critics were thinking, well, maybe he'll have a miraculous recovery and we'll get a, another book, you know, Rabbit at the Nursing Home. <laughs> <laughs> But I think I think it, it must be hard for a writer to to surrender a vehicle that gives you so much power. Um, but I, I, you know, he's also an omnivorous writer. I, I mean, I, I would say that you know I love a lot of his stories and I love those rabbit books, and I'm quite indifferent to a, a, a lot of the rest of his work. Um, and you know, and I'm sure he wouldn't be insulted. No, I mean, he writes such a, a wide variety of stuff, and and sometimes I can't recognize the guy who wrote Rabbit in these other, these other pieces. In the same way that, that Philip Roth's book, The Ghost Rider, just mm-hmm. kind of mm-hmm. sits out there like outside of his other work. It, it just seems to have come <clears throat> from a, a different writer. And, and he's never really attempted to, um, to do anything quite like that ag- again. Why don't we take one more question? Oh, um, well, this will go to what, what Tom was just talking about. I, I think um, what, what I've, I did, um, and it's funny because I've, I've never read Rabbit at Rest. Um, I sort of like saved it because I, I keep thinking, no, he's not really dead. Um, and so it, 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 uh, now that I know that he's really dead, I'm kind of bummed up. Um, <laughs> Um, no need to read it. No, I think that it's it's a very interesting thing to do because, um, and I, I think I'm not sure it was the right decision for exactly what, what you both are talking about because that was such a wonderful prism through which to see everything that we were going through at, at and you and you kind of waited for his take on the decade, and now you know his take is you know, he's dead and, and so there's no real take to come and and I'm I'm like you I I kind of float. Um, uh, a lot, I've read a lot of the short stories. I've read, um, I love, um, oh, God, what was the big wife swapping one? Uh, couples? couples? Couples. God, I love that book. Um, uh, I'm, I am like, my hard drive's done, too. Um, but uh, I think the, the thing with a, a series, um, uh, you should always know when to get off the stage. I think you should always know that as a writer. Um, you should always know when to end a book. Um, because otherwise you could go on for an extra hundred pages and, and, and I'm sure some people would like it, but it's probably not very good. Um, and so what I felt with my series was I said that once they stopped knocking on the door, I would not plug them into a plot. Um, that's the only thing I owe both them and myself, actually, and the reader. Um, because I don't want to write one just because, um... You know, I don't want to. I know that my publisher would would back up a truckload of money into my driveway if I wrote one more of those books now, <laughs> which is funny because nobody was buying them back then. Um, but uh, I, I know that, and I like that image. I like that sort of. <laughs> um, but I I don't ever want to write a crappy book, and then and then when people say, "Why'd you write such a crappy book?" Say, "Have you seen my pool?" Um, <laughs> So, uh, I said I would, my, my very kind of arty thing with them was always if they, if they stop knocking, then they will, I will allow them to go off in peace. If they knock again, I will welcome them in because they bought my first house. But um, if they don't, I'm happy to let them exit on, a, on stage on a high note. And, I off, and I'll be totally honest, I, off, I, I felt like when I was writing the fifth book that I was getting cute. The book, the book gets cute in places, and I, I didn't like that. Um, so I think they, I like, again, I love that image of that truck, and I, and, and I would love if they came knocking again, and I really miss Patrick's voice. I loved writing in Patrick's voice. It was so easy. It's the only first-person writing I've ever done, or ever will do, I think. Um, and it was funny. It was a very funny voice. It was much funnier than I am. It, the great thing about writing that type of voice is it's all highway lines, you know, um, uh, I call hi- highway lines are the thing that occur to you ten minutes later that you should have said, but you're on the highway. 
Um, Patrick Kenzie is all highway lines because I have time to think of them. I'm sitting there and I'm like, how would he respond to that in a really cool way? Or what would, what would be a really cool thing to say about this? Or, or something that's been in my pocket for a while in a way. You know, like I always wanted to make this observation about this. I can pull it out. Um, so I miss that voice. And so if anything ever brings me back, it will be that voice or them sort of knocking on the door saying, okay, we have a story now. Um, but I don't want to see them like, you know, my fear would be, you know, I get to the point where, I start plugging them into plots, and they go on a cruise, you know, and, and, and the chef gets killed, and they're the only ones who can solve it, you know, or, or that whole thing of when you read a series, after a while you get into that sort of Charlie Brown issue where, you know, Charlie Brown can't age. And those books have always consistently been about him aging. The, the, the fifth book is very much about how tired he is of violence. And, and I just thought, if I, if I continue his aging, you know, he's going to be throwing walkers at the bad guys. And so, you know, I, I don't envision that really well, too. So, you know, if there is one more, it'll be the, the final. In fact, I've already said I will call it the final detective novel. Yeah, so. Well, uh, it's been indicated that the cheese is peaking over there, oh. so we should go. Um, but I want to thank, um, thank our panelists and thank, thank you all you. for coming.